Today, we're very happy to welcome Jesse Marshall to present with us. Jesse is a postdoctoral fellow with Benzo Obleksky in the Harvard Department of Organismal and Evolutionary Behavior. He received his undergraduate degrees in physics and mathematics from the University of Chicago. He then completed his PhD in physics with Mark Snitcher at Stanford University, where he develops new optical approaches for recording neural activity and apply them to elucidate the neural basis of movement disorders. And today at the Olbecki lab, he continues to invent new techniques for behavior tracking and uses them to investigate the neural basis of movement. Jesse is also the recipient of a K99R00 fellowship. So Jesse, uh, thank you so much for joining us today and please take it away. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be uh, speaking with you all today. Um, hopefully in the coming months, if you have any follow-up questions, you can come by the lab. Um, but until then, uh, we'll, we'll settle for this. So yeah, I'm going to tell you about a, a pair of new techniques that we developed um, for measuring animal behavior and then their applications uh, in kind of modeling and, and synthesizing this behavior in silico. Uh, and animal behavior has been a sort of hot topic in neuroscience in recent years, uh, but it's of kind of basic interest to a much broader range of disciplines. Um, so in biology, uh, investigators from, from genomics to psychology are interested in understanding sort of the diverse uh, biological basis of animal behavior from its genetic components all the way up to neural circuits. Uh, People in, in medicine and engineering, as well as biology, are also interested in using animal behavior as a tool for preclinical testing of, of uh, therapies in animal models of disease, uh, for biologically inspired robotics, and uh, to build more humanitarian agricultural uh, systems. And, you know, much of the impetus and, and technologies for measuring behavior have come traditionally from work in humans, uh, where performance capture has found a niche in sports and Hollywood. Uh, and more recently, augmented reality and virtual reality applications are kind of driving a big boom in markerless uh, pose detection approaches. Uh, but you know, the reason that animal behavior has become, I think, so important and so vital uh, to neuroscience in recent years is that we've gotten very good at measuring from the brain. Uh, so in this classic plot from Conrad Cording and Ian Stevenson, uh, they're taking uh, each point here is a, a study uh, using electrophysiology and they're plotting the number of simultaneously recorded neurons as a function of the, the study's publication date. Uh, and the y axis here is on a log scale and so you can see that there has been an exponential increase in our ability to simultaneously record from neurons. Uh, and in recent years, this means hundreds or thousands of neurons, uh, e even in freely moving animals. And so we've gotten very good at recording from the brain. Uh, in contrast, if we just put up a, a sort of schematic plot of our ability to record from animal behavior, say the number of simultaneously recorded key points on an animal's body that we can measure, uh, this has really not kept pace with our ability to record from the brain. Uh, even modern approaches can record maybe five key points from an animal, uh, but it's still often in a very across a very limited range of different behaviors. So there's a really tremendous uh, gap between our ability to record from the brain and our ability to record behavior. And this really limits our ability to understand, uh, say, the function of motor systems, which we think control diverse parts of the body. Uh, it limits our ability to understand sensory systems, which we now know uh, are strongly affected by the ongoing behavior and movements of animals, uh, and a diverse range of other questions in neuroscience, such as social behaviors, uh, where without a detailed understanding of the animal's body language, we're not, it, it'll be very difficult to decipher the types of social interactions that are going on. And this imbalance between recording from the brain and recording in, animal behavior is sort of an endemic, uh, endemic to neuroscience. Uh, so, you know, it's not just recording neural activity. We've developed diverse approaches for uh, manipulating uh, brain function through engineered fluorescent probes and uh, ion channels. Uh, we've developed increasingly baroque uh, microscopes uh, to record from these probes and to 
uh, perturb the activity of identified cells and neural circuits. And in connectomics, we have uh, 61 beam scanning electron microscopes uh, that allow us to record the anatomy of neural circuits with really nanometer scale precision. Uh, in contrast, uh, we will stop at almost everything to record the behavior of animals. Um, by and large, the, the gold standard or uh, typical means of measuring behavior in, in studies was just to simply describe it or to hand annotate it. Uh, more recently, work using videography and you know, digitized using tools from machine learning has allowed for uh, some quantification of the ongoing behavior of animals. Uh, but it still pales in comparison to our ability to record from the brain. And you know, I think that this gap is now widely recognized. And I think in the next five or 10 years, uh, we're gonna see substantial improvements uh, in our ability to record from behavior. And I think where these innovations are going uh, is to allow for measurement of behavior in increasingly naturalistic and ethological paradigms. And so we can have animals in complex visual environments and complex tasks or in even ecological scenarios. Uh, we can use non-invasive measurements with cameras or, you know, say a probe on the animal's head cap to record the, the full 3D pose and body surface of animals, uh, to track their eye and whisker and other effector positions, uh, to track the underlying muscular activity driving a lot of these kinematic changes, uh, in measuring en the animal's endocrine neuromodulatory state, as well as a broad range of other behavioral parameters. And in many cases, we have tools for measuring these variables, often in isolation and in very reduced settings. And I think a lot of the work that needs to happen over the next decade is making these measurements uh, more integrated, uh, easier to use, uh, and available over a much broader range of different behaviors. Now, today, I'm not going to be talking about all of these. I'm just going to be talking about measurements of the animal's 3D pose. And this is a, a, a measurement that has seen some progress in recent years through the development of convolutional neural networks for pose tracking. However, as I'll show, most of these networks are sort of explicitly designed for 2D pose tracking. Uh, and they scale poorly to measurements in 3D and measurements across multiple behaviors. And so while I think they've been very impactful for neuroscientists looking at behavioral tasks, when you have a fairly limited range of different behaviors animals perform, they scale poorly to these more complex naturalistic environments. However, there is a tool that is very effective in for 3D pose tracking in sort of complex optical environments, uh, but it's only really been used in humans. Uh, and this is motion capture, which is a te technique that might be familiar to many of you uh, from Hollywood, where you can take an actor such as Andy Serkis you can put them in a, a suit uh, with a number of markers attached. And these markers have a special property known as retroreflectivity, uh, where light that shines on the marker um, ref is reflected straight back. And so if you use a specialized type of camera known as a motion capture camera that has a ring light around a camera lens, uh, then you can use this to obtain a very high signal to noise recording of the marker's position. If you do this across multiple different cameras, then you can triangulate the position of these markers in 3D uh, to then visualize the actor as an animated character like Gollum. But while motion capture has been very important for human studies, uh, it's been difficult to apply to model systems uh, because it's hard to put animals in a suit and it's hard to keep uh, these little tiny foam markers attached for long periods of time. Uh, we got around this by deploying uh, another technique that's been well established in humans, uh, namely body piercings. So we developed an approach, uh, or we developed a set of markers made of high index of refraction glass uh, that could act as almost perfect uh, retroreflectors. And then we developed a custom set of body piercings where we could attach these markers uh, to the animal uh, chronically for long periods of time. Uh, and you know, these, much like human body piercings, have sort of very minimal effects on the animal's ongoing behavior. And as you can see from this video on the right, where I have an animal with a number of markers uh, attached to it behaving in an arena, uh, 
there is a very high signal to noise that you can obtain using these markers. So they're the, the sort of glowing white spheres that you can see in the movie. Uh, using these attached markers, we developed an approach known as uh, capture. And so we have an animal that's actively behaving in an open field arena. And then we attach a set of 20 markers to the animal's head, trunk, and limbs. And then we use a calibrated array uh, of 12 cameras to uh, record the position of these markers and triangulate them into 3D with submillimeter precision and millisecond time scale resolution. Uh, this allows us to visualize uh, the full pose of the animal, which we uh, visualize as a, a wireframe, as you can see here with the head in blue, the trunk in red, and the limbs in different colors. Now, one of the advantages of motion capture uh, compared to, say, video data is that the data is very lightweight. Uh, we're just recording the marker positions rather than the full video files. And this allows us to make these recordings continuously for 24 seven across days and weeks across the full range of different behaviors that animals perform. And this allows us to really get a very ground truth assessment of the diverse types of behaviors that animals make. Uh, but it's not just a, a useful tool for behavioral identification and, and sort of approaches in computational ethology. Uh, we can also use capture to report the exact behavioral kinematics of animals. So this is a side-by-side -side movie where I'm showing you on the left, uh, the animal's uh, movements visualized as this wireframe. And then on the right, the velocity of three markers on the animal's head, trunk, and hind limbs. And this is slowed down by about fourfold. Uh, and so as you, this animal makes a behavior known as the wet dog shake, uh, you can see we can report very highly precise oscillations of activity um, in these different markers. And so, Capture is a, I think, a very powerful tool for high precision, long time scale recording uh, in rats. Uh, but of course, there's a number of different applications in behavior where it would be nice to not have to attach markers to animals. Uh, and uh, it would also be nice to not have to use a, a large motion capture array, but to use a smaller set of, say, off the shelf uh, machine vision cameras. It would, of course, be nice to use this in a greater diversity of model systems, uh, such as mice or marmosets. And the question of how to read out an animal's pose from just normal uh, video cameras is a classic question in computer vision known as markerless pose detection, or here specifically markerless 3D pose detection. And the conventional way this is done in neuroscience today is to use a 2D continents. So in this approach, you would take uh, multiple video inputs of an animal from different perspectives. You would then take a convolutional network, such as a leap or an animal part tracker or a deep lab cut. And then you would label a, a set of, say, a few hundred frames of this animal behaving in these video frames. And then you would use these examples to extract a set of key point predictions of the animal. Uh, and then using the known position of these cameras, you can triangulate these predictions into 3D to read out the animal's full 3D pose. The challenge, however, is that these approaches have really only been applied um, in sort of across single behaviors and fairly restrictive environments. And so it's not clear how many cameras or how many training frames you would need to extend them uh, to measurements across multiple behaviors in uh, 3D. So to test this, we used Capture to collect a large ground truth training and benchmark data set uh, we call for called RAT7M. And so you can see we're recording Capture, which I'm showing as the wireframe here on the left. And then we had six synchronized video cameras that you can see on the right, uh, where that were calibrated in the same reference frame as the motion capture array. And we could then project these capture recordings into the six video frames to get perfectly labeled uh, examples of the animal behavior, uh, resulting in this large 7 million frame data set that we could use to really benchmark how much data do you need to train these uh, 2D convnets to do accurate 3D pose estimation. Uh, this data set is divided into different action categories as well, um, both to train the networks over a balanced set of data and then also for benchmarking future pose detection algorithms 
um, and evaluating their performance within specific action types. So if we uh, take uh, RAT7M and we train here deep lab cut uh, using uh, making predictions using six cameras and give it 10,000 of these perfectly labeled uh, training frames, uh, we can compare this to capture. And so I'm, I'm showing you here side by side movies with the capture recordings on the left and the deep lab cut recordings uh, here on the right. Uh, and the reprojections on the top and just the wireframe reconstructions on the bottom. And you can see that the wireframe reconstructions from deep lab cut uh, show much larger jitter uh, than the capture measurements. If we quantify this uh, by looking across different training frames, numbers of training frames for deep lab cut from 100 to 100,000, and looking at the mean error to capture measurements uh, and across different numbers of cameras from 3 to, to 12, what we find is that in general, deep lab cut can still only get a precision of about 18 millimeters uh, for these recordings, which is comparable to the distance between two markers on the rats forelimb. Uh, and it really means that these tools, which I should emphasize, are really fantastic for measurements uh, in behavioral tasks. You know, these are things we use uh, in the lab uh, every day. Uh, but when you try to extend them to these uh, much more diverse sets of behaviors uh, in freely moving animals, uh, they really struggle to perform well. And there's really kind of five reasons, at least, uh, for why these 2D combinets sort of struggle in 3D key point detection. So the first is occlusions. When animals are freely moving, uh, parts of the body are occluded. And these 2D networks uh, really can't make predictions of an occluded marker. The second is perspective changes. So if an animal is close to a video, for, close to the camera or further away, its relative size will change. And this will mean that you the, the filters that the network is trying to use to extract key points are changing. And so you need to add labeled examples. And it also means that it's hard to use spatial statistics, such as, say, the length between uh, the, the arm markers or the distance between, say, the head and the spine. It's harder to use these spatial priors to constrain or refine predictions. Uh, a third challenge is just behavioral diversity. If animals are making multiple behaviors, uh, then you need to have more labels for each of these uh, behaviors, which can end up requiring many, many labels. Uh, kind of relatedly, uh, in comparison to 2D, where you know some of the success of these 2D convenets uh, for animal key point detection come from uh, having large pre-training data sets in humans with labeled key point examples, uh, these data sets are much fewer and have much more limited diversity in the case of 3D pose detection. And uh, lastly, uh, these networks are simply lack many of the needed inductive biases in architectural features to perform 3D key point detection. So camera uh, predictions are made independently. So a camera on the left-hand side of the animal uh, doesn't constrain what a camera on the right-hand side of the animal is thinking. And then all of the reasoning that's going on in these network is very much in, in 2D and doesn't have any sense of uh, 3D reasoning. So to kind of address all of these challenges, uh, we developed a new uh, convolutional network approach for 3D pose detection uh, known that we call DANCE uh, that is coming out in Nature Methods and I think the May issue. Uh, and so DANCE overcomes many of these weaknesses inherent to uh, 2D pose detection by using a trick known as unprojection. So, you know, in addition to having these video frames, we know where many of these cameras are in space. We know their position, their orientation, and focal length. Using this information, we can reconstruct the set of light rays consistent with a given image uh, of an animal in 3D. Uh, and this is this differentiable unprojection operation. If we do this from multiple different views, what we get is a fully 3D feature space where the position of different key points in 3D space corresponds to the intersections of light, light rays in these unprojected views. So if we discretize this space, we can then train a 3D convenet uh, to identify the position of key points from these light ray intersections. Now, there's a couple aspects of this that I want to mention. Uh, the first is that these volumes are centered on the position of the animal. 
And this network is trained using RAT7M, which contains 30 different uh, camera views. And so as a result, the network is very robust in, to changes in the uh, position of cameras uh, that you're using to make your recordings. A second feature is that this feature space, because it's in units uh, of millimeters, uh, is metric. And this allows it to be to both be kind of robust to different changes in perspectives, whether the animal is close or far away from a camera. And it also allows the network to learn uh, spatial priors about how uh, far apart uh, different key points are and uses these to constrain its predictions in an end-to-end -end fashion. And you know, lastly, because this feature space is explicitly 3D, the network naturally learns uh, to say, constrain predictions from one camera by the predictions from another. So if we compare dance uh, to uh, deep lab cut here for tracking rats not bearing markers, uh, it, it, I'm again showing you the re video reprojections on the top uh, and in comparison to the wireframe uh, reconstructions of animals here on the bottom. And once again, the 3D tracking with deep lab cut is showing far more uh, jitter in these markerless animals. If we quantify this, uh, visualizing the, the mean air uh, versus capture uh, with dance here in shades of blue and uh, deep lab cut here in shades of orange and peach, uh, dance uh, achieves air uh, as low as three millimeters uh, for recordings in these animals, whereas the deep lab cut air is even for uh, six cameras and having several hundred thousand training frames uh, really only get down to airs of about um, say 15 or 20 millimeters. So, you know, dance is a fantastic tool for post tracking in rats, uh, but is also readily extendable to recordings and other species. Um, and so we collaborated with multiple other labs, including uh, Kyle Severson and Fan Wang, uh, who are now your colleagues over at MIT. Um, and, you know, this, the, you can see Kyle's mouse, he's doing some really beautiful pose detection over here on the left. Uh, and, you know, other labs, the Arnav lab at, at um, Columbia and David Hildebrand and, and work in um, at Rockefeller and Winter Friedwald's lab are getting some really fantastic recordings in chickadees and marmosets. And so, you know, dance is, I think, somewhat unexpectedly able to generalize across these different uh, species and environments. Uh, and the, the code for this is available up on GitHub and we'll be running through example applications of this in the tutorial today. So, you know, I think that capture and dance uh, together sort of illustrate how I think a lot of the progress in behavioral tracking will be made uh, in the coming years, where we're going to pair high precision behavioral observatories like capture or say those made using synthetic data sets. And then we're going to use these to train a uh, tailored deep neural networks, so those with inductive biases sort of specifically suited to the pose detection problem, to teach these high precision measurements to generalize across different hardware and species. Um, and I think what's coming is, is higher resolution measurements of animal kinematics and eventually skeletal kinematics of animals' body surfaces uh, and of you know, increasingly complex and natural behaviors such as social behaviors. Uh, and I think already we're able to use capture to record across multiple different animals. Um, and I think that, you know, these data sets will again be very useful uh, both for benchmarking uh, the many, many existing uh, approaches that are out there for social behavioral tracking in animals, uh, as well as to develop new algorithms uh, like dance for 3D pose tracking in multiple behaving animals at once. So uh, with these uh, behavioral techniques, um, this now raises a, a number of questions in, in behavioral analysis and opens a lot of new avenues in uh, behavioral analysis. Uh, but before I turn to that, I'm going to uh, say that it's time to say, start the, the collab demonstration. Uh, simply because uh, it takes a little while for the code to run. Uh, and I was going to kind of give a quick tour of this, but I think I'm only sharing this window. 
So if you have Colab open, um, I'm just going to start running the notebook and then we're going to turn back to it uh, once we sort of formally start the uh, hands on portion of the talk. Um, I just wanted to get this starting now because uh, we have to download some video files into Colab, which inevitably causes takes a little bit of time. So with that running, uh, and I'm going to take silence as a sign that uh, people are able to sort of get this running to their satisfaction. I'm going to turn to talk a little bit about behavioral analysis. So Capture and Dance are able to record the 3D kinematics of animal behaviors over extremely long time scales. Um, so Capture can record uh, kinematics over multiple days, as you can see here, uh, where we're able to visualize, say, the transitions of animals between periods of wakefulness and sleep. Uh, of course, if we look on very fine time scales, these approaches can also be used to identify the presence of different behaviors, say walking and rearing, um, and also the, the really underlying kinematics driving these behaviors. So if you look at these bottom traces on the left, you can see some very oscillatory activity in the green trace, the right hind limb. So this is the animal scratching at the very beginning of this sequence. You can then see a very high velocity, wet dog shape type behavior that I introduced before. Uh, and so on and so forth. So these approaches are able to record, you know, the sort of millisecond time scale kinematic motifs of different limbs, their organization into behaviors, the organization of these behaviors and in more intermediate time scale into uh, repeated patterns like behavioral sequences, and then their long term organization into sequences and states. And one of the values of 3D kinematics is that these measurements can be made reproducibly across different labs. Uh, so if uh, we measure some 3D kinematics here at Harvard and, and uh, a group at MIT, say Kyle is recording some kinematics uh, over in, in Van Wang's lab, uh, then we can compare and we can have common uh, definitions for what behaviors we're observing. And so I think my hope in the long term is that uh, in the coming years, behavioral analysis turns into something like uh, analysis of, of nucleotide sequences and DNA. Uh, where you can take a, a DNA sequence uh, such of A, C, T's, and G's like you see here, you can copy it and enter it into a BLAST search, a basic local alignment search, uh, to you know, search a very large database of different uh, sequences that have been uh, measured uh, and to identify what is the exact uh, protein that you're looking at. Um, so when you run BLAST, takes a second because it's a government agency, um, but you end up with a bunch of, of hits. Uh, you can see the top one is uh, this potassium inward rectifying channel, uh, KCNJ2. Uh, and then we can go do more than just identifying it. We can go through a gene ontology database, search for KCNJ2. Again, we find a number of hits. We can look at uh, this protein in uh, mice. Uh, and we see that this inward rectifying potassium channel participates in establishing the action potential waveform uh, and excitability of neural and muscle tissues. So we can see that it's located in neurons, in the heart, in the muscles. We can look at its subcellular organization and even its exact protein sequence or uh, crystallographic sequence. And you know, this knowledge uh, in genomics is really at your fingertips. And I think our hope is that in the long term, we can take these kinematic recordings uh, and have similar databases where we can start to just uh, read out the behavior that an animal is, is engaged in and uh, other aspects, descriptive aspects of these behaviors in a sort of behavioral ontology search. But of course, we're not there yet. Um, and so, you know, we've developed a, a set of pipelines for, for trying to do some of this work in identifying structure in these behavioral data sets. And our entry point um, to analyzing these kinematics is, is first identifying stereotyped behaviors that the animals perform. And the pipeline for doing this is to take a capture dance uh, recording of 3D kinematics, uh, defining a set of features, describing the animal's pose and kinematics on individual frames. And so these are often things like the eigenposes of the animal uh, and a time frequency transform, like a wavelet transform of these eigenposes so that you're getting information about the uh, kinematics in a local window. Uh, 
you can then take this high dimensional feature set and embed it in 2D using TSNI. Um, so we now have a density map here uh, where different density peaks correspond to uh, performance uh, of similar behaviors. And then from this embedding space, we can then uh, cluster out uh, different uh, peaks that we observe and then annotate them with different behavioral names. Now, uh, this procedure of taking a high dimensional data set, uh, defining a, a correspondingly high dimensional set of features and then uh, clustering it is, is common to many workflows uh, in biological and other sciences. And oftentimes there's a conversation about uh, you know, what algorithm you're using, say, for dimensionality reduction, whether it's, you know, TSNI or ISOMAP or UMAP, um, and about, say, the types of clustering you're doing, whether it is a uh, k-means or an information-based clustering or hierarchical clustering. And I'd just like to emphasize here that, you know, these distinctions between types of algorithms are important, but ultimately, probably the biggest factor that determines what types of behavioral clusters you get out from these pipelines is the types of features that you put into them. Um, and so if you look at papers that are really doing kind of unsupervised behavioral analysis, um, you know, oftentimes there's an extensive method section on the features that are used because uh, it's diverse types of things that can impact your ability to extract different behaviors. So it's not just the eigenposes and their velocity, it's also the animals, say, center of mass and the center of mass on different time scales, um, and maybe the distance of the animal, say, from a wall. And so uh, oftentimes I think it's important to kind of think critically about the types of, of features that one uses. And I think we're still kind of a bit in the infancy of determining what the exact set of features to use for behavioral analysis are. Um, so, you know, with these pipelines, uh, I'll show you an example of what one of these behavioral maps uh, looks like. Uh, so here I'm going to show a, a movie where on the left hand side is a, a single cluster visualized from the TC space and it's going to I'm going to show you examples from different clusters in the space and then on the right hand side, these wireframe representations of the animal. Uh, made using uh, from just sort of six randomly drawn clusters uh, uh, instances from this cluster rather. So these different colored regions in the TSNI space that I'm sort of switching between uh, correspond to different uh, categories of behavior. So grooming, scratching, walking, locomotion, et cetera. Uh, and if I was to show you different subclusters within these colored regions, they would typically correspond to different kinematic or postural variants of these behaviors. So rearing to different heights, walking at different speeds, uh, grooming different parts of the body and so on and so forth. Uh, with these approaches, we can both identify behaviors, but then we can also extract out their underlying kinematics. And so we can determine exact kinematic fingerprints of these behaviors. So for rhythmic behaviors, we can look at say the power spectral density of markers. Uh, so take a marker on the trunk, look at its uh, frequency transform to see how much power is in different frequency bands. And we find for instance that there's many different types of wet dog shakes that have very variable amplitudes, but they all occur at a precisely 15 hertz uh, frequency. Similarly, there are a variety of different types of left grooming behaviors. Again, very different types of amplitude, grooming different parts of the body, uh, but they all really correspond to or have a center frequency of just about four hertz. In contrast, scratching behaviors, say, uh, are far more variable in their underlying frequency. Um, and I think that these kinematic fingerprints are sort of an example of what would go into a sort of behavioral ontology where we could have sort of four different species, uh, you know, what are the exact kinematic fingerprints underlying the different behaviors that occur in this frequency. Uh, and it's not just these short, short time scale kinematics that we can start to analyze. We can also use these kinematic recordings to understand the organization of behavior on longer timescales. So if we start from an ethogram, a description of the animal's behavioral usage over time, uh, we can smooth this ethogram on different timescales and then look at the pairwise relationship or the pairwise similarity between uh, different uh, time points, which now represent uh, a density vector of behaviors that occur in a local window. And so peaks in the in sort of off diagonal peaks rather in these 
uh, similarity maps correspond to reuse of different patterns of behavior, so similar sets of grooming or rearing or locomotor sequences. Uh, and then we can use a clustering uh, approach to just identify repeated patterns of behavior um, on these various time scales. And what this spits out uh, is occurs on short time scales of 15 seconds. Uh, different behavioral sequences like walking or scratching or grooming. Uh, and, you know, we find that if you look at the transition matrix of these patterns that extracts, they have sort of sequential uh, ordering consistent with sort of having a stereotype sequence. And if we look on longer time scales, so if we take the ethogram, we smooth it on a longer time scale, look for repeated patterns in this smooth ethogram we find uh, more behavioral states corresponding to changes in arousal uh, as the animal is exploring in the arena or in a maintenance state uh, consisting of various types uh, of grooming behavior or performance of a behavioral task that we often have our animals use. So with this suite of approaches, uh, I think we have a basic scaffold for taking these kinematic data streams uh, and really bringing some order to them uh, by identifying these different behaviors, sort of the exact kinematic features of these behaviors and their longer time scale organization into sequences and states. And the last component of this work that I want to mention is that we can also use these kinematic recordings uh, for you know, generative modeling of behavior itself. Um, and so, uh, you know, what we can do is we can take a physical model of an animal. Uh, and so this is a, a model in a physics simulator that uh, has a skeleton uh, and a set of masses associated with different points in the skeleton. And we can use deep reinforcement learning uh, to uh, both train this skeleton uh, from scratch to solve multiple tasks. Um, and then we can also use these kinematic data and use imitation learning to train this network to imitate the exact uh, behaviors that these animals are performing. Um, and I think what these approaches will allow us to do um, is you know, taking inspiration uh, mostly from kind of the work going on at, at MIT uh, is to take these networks which really can act as artificial motor systems. And we can now use them to compare with the motor system of real animals to identify commonalities and also differences in the structure uh, of motor representations uh, and their hierarchical organization and differences over nuclei. Uh, and so I think these approaches um, are a way that we can start to extend many of these types of network analyses, which I think have been, you know, again, so beautifully illustrated in sensory systems to the motor domain. Uh, you know, with this, um, I'd just like to say that we are uh, recruiting. Uh, if you know any fantastic, say, undergraduates or, or technicians interested in work uh, over the summer or, say, next year, we're looking for people sort of across diverse areas in the lab. Um, so feel free to reach out if you or someone you know uh, is, is looking for a spot at sort of the intersection of, of animal behavior and neuroscience and, and deep learning. Uh, and I'd just like to close by thanking everyone that uh, contributed to this work. Uh, in, in particular, Tim Dunn, uh, who is a, a former graduate student at Harvard, but is now an assistant professor at, at Duke University, um, as well as Diego Alderondo, uh, who is a fantastic graduate student in the lab, uh, the Alexi lab, um, that's contributed to, to most of the projects you see here. Um, so with that, maybe I'll take, if there's any questions on the sort of talk portion of the tutorial uh, before transitioning to the more uh, hands-on tutorial section. Yeah, so all of all of this this tracking stuff is really cool. Um, I, I was wondering if if you'd be able to share sort of what the limitations are. So like are there um, are there places where where sort of like the best system fails um, and or or is it is it perfect <laughs> and everyone should be using it? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and I think that the two things I'll say are number one, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of room left at the bottom uh, in that there's a lot of the parts of the body that we still are not able to measure. Um, and so 
you know, some of my other work, you know, involves recordings from the motor system and trying to correlate motor responses with behavior. And there's still questions about, you know, what parts of the body, if any, are driving these changes um, in addition to say sort of sensory systems. And so I think that, you know, there's still a lot of work that we need to do to, you know, really get exact recordings of the animal's behavior. Uh, with respect to sort of dance, which I think is probably the most uh, accessible of these two techniques of capture and dance. Um, I think the limitation with these approaches is still, is still training data. And so I think that compared to 2D continents, dance is far more sample efficient, right? Where, you know, Kyle, I think is labeling several hundred frames of mice that are freely behaving. Um, I think to get that level of precision with a deep lab cut, you would need, you know, tens of thousands of frames. So it's far more sample efficient, but hundreds of frames is still not nothing. And I think you also find with these that if you substantially change the environment, uh, you need to label additional training frames. And so I think that this is obviously a very active area in machine learning. And so there's approaches using everything from types of augmentation and neural rendering to uh, synthetic data that I think are addressing these, but that's still sort of, I would say an ongoing challenge for biological investigation. Uh, Jesse, um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, how one would um, apply this to uh, an, a species that is uh, that looks different with a different body plan, for example? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And we'll be touching on some of this in the in the tutorial section. Um, but in general, dance is very flexible where you'll just kind of define a set of key points that you want to measure and like a set of skeletal linkages between them. And then you'll supply that set of labeled data to the algorithm. Um, and it should extend that to, you know, that species. Um, yeah, I guess the part that I didn't quite understand is, would you have to start with um, the markers on, on animals or is the idea that, that it would transfer somehow? Yeah, great question. Um, this would transfer. And so you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to have a full marker data set. You could use just uh, say a hundred or a couple hundred time points um, of, of the, an, of the markerless animals behavior. Um, so for all the work that uh, our collaborators and us did in, in mice and marmosets and chickadees, none of those animals uh, had, were wearing markers. I guess just a quick follow-up to that question. Um, and, and maybe this was partially answered by that. Um, I'm interested is in, in like different species, larger species, obviously like humans are, are very important to study, but you have, has any work tried to apply this yet to something like a, uh, uh, rhesus macaques or species that are like a little more different kinematically than than the movement uh, of, a, of a mouse? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question also. And I think, um, you know, related to all of this is is the question, you know, this network has been trained on, on rats. And so, you know, it's very hard to sort of empirically guess or gauge how effective the, you know, transfer capabilities are to different species. Um, I can say that you know, many aspects of the, of the network um, make it, make transfer to new environments fairly robust. Um, and so the fact that volumes are centered on animals, the fact that it's, uh, you know, in this sort of metric space, uh, make it much easier to scale to, to new environments because what the network has learned is not just about, you know, where rat key points are in space, but it's learned a more general ability to kind of reason 3D about how, you know, different light rays intersect to, uh, define key points. It's learned to start to learn relationships between, you know, how key points on, on one side of the animal constrain another. And, you know, like all things in sort of deep learning, I mean, it's a little squishy. Uh, it's a little empirical. Uh, but there's a lot of reasons to think that, you know, these are driving and this ability to reason geometrically are driving sort of uh, a increased ability to transfer to new settings. And so, the largest species we've tried, well, we have tried it on humans and both adults and infants and it, it works well. Um, and so, 
yeah, the, the size is not really as a, a, a large driver. You just need to change uh, a couple parameters that you use uh, in, the, in the network. Awesome, that's great to hear. Um, is there like a, is that work published, the stuff on humans yet or? Uh, the humans will not be part of the, the paper. I think it's just, we applied it to one of the human uh, benchmark data sets, uh, but the, the paper will be out soon. Gotcha, thanks. I guess on the topic of transferring, you could transfer to other animals and it sounds like you have or humans, but if you wanted to grade how accurately it's performing beyond just like an eyeball test, you would still need either some kind of data set that has accurately measured markers or uh, or do that yourself with, with the, uh, um, the original 3D capture set up with the body piercings. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So for uh, empirically validating transfer success, we have typically used just human observers. And so we'll take, um, you know, two people labeling, you know, if we have a mouse, we have two people labeled that uh, mouse and instead of say 20 key points in the mouse and then gauge, you know, how accurate are the, or how do the dance predictions uh, compare to these human labelers. And in general, we find that the, I think it's the dance to human air is, is kind of comparable to the human to human air. Um, and, you know, it is though, I'll, I'll say, you know, it's not going to be quite as precise as, you know, a rat where you have, you know, several million frames of training data, but it still is, is I think, you know, better and it can also, you know, label occluded key points not visible to humans. Um, other question is, do you have any plans to extend this, uh, like imminent plans to extend this to tracking multiple objects? Because there's a whole lot of data association problems that get much more complicated when you have multiple targets. Yeah, a great question. We are very interested in extending this to multiple objects. Um, you know, I think the 3D capabilities are very beneficial for multi-animal tracking uh, because you can you know, if you think about two rodents interacting, there's obviously a lot of occlusions and having a method that's far more robust to occlusions uh, can really help. But uh, we don't yet have anything to share sort of on that front. Yeah, very great talk. I'm wondering if you have tried any like a different animal uh, mouse model or you have to do some like a drug induction that can that is known to alter the behaviors and then you test your model to see if you can dissect them out. Um, yeah, have you ever tried that type of test? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we haven't done anything with dance in mice, um, I think. Uh, in, in rats, we have done work uh, in the capture paper with uh, drugs as well as some models of autism. Um, but, and so I think that the kinds of analysis approaches for identifying, say, behavioral structure on multiple time scales, and then comparing these across species, you could sort of extrapolate out from what we've done in the capture paper. Great, thank you. Yeah. Does this uh, technique uh, uh, presume that you have uh, three or more cameras, and do those cameras have to be at a certain angle relative to one another? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. Um, and so dance requires um, one, at least one camera and knowledge of the animal's center of mass, which generally requires uh, having two cameras. Um, but so uh, because it's learned about 3D structure, it is possible in principle to make predictions from a single camera. Uh, but in general, we use somewhere between, I would say three and six cameras, uh, which is I think generally possible uh, in most lab lab recording environments. Um, with respect to camera arrangement, we've had good results uh, with many different types of camera arrangements, you know, from having one on either side and, and one on the top to having them sort of elevated and inclined at different uh, configurations. Uh, the one that I would avoid is having two cameras facing each other because this can cause uh, really profound degeneracies in uh, triangulations. Uh, but we haven't found in general that, you know, one configuration works substantially better than others. I would say that most of the variation that we've had is, you know, simply if you have enough labeled training frames up to say a couple hundred and then performance is generally good for everything.
I'll give a couple slides overview and then we can can go to the notebook and maybe I'll switch my switch my screen share there. And so the tutorial will go over application of dance to a recording of a mouse from multiple video cameras. And so to use dance, there's there's a few different steps. And so sort of the entry point, which we've just been discussing, is that you need to have a set of cameras, uh, and so probably at least three. Um, and these cal cameras need to be calibrated in some global reference frame, uh, which is sort of a standardized procedure in computer vision to determine their 3D position and uh, aspects of, of the lens, like its distortions and focal length. Uh, in addition, uh, the video from this these cameras needs to be, or it typically helps if it's uh, compressed in some manner uh, and formatted according to, you know, so that dance can, can read it in. So it needs to be sort of have the, the right file structure. Uh, and then you need some uh, training examples. Um, and so for a new animal, a new data set, you need some uh, examples of where the center of mass of the animal is. Uh, and the different key points that you want to measure. Uh, and so that's about, oh, and so, you know, typically uh, about 100 of those. With this in hand, um, you can then use the dance algorithm. And so the first thing dance is going to do is it's going to find the center of mass of the animal. Uh, then using the multiple video cameras, uh, we can triangulate the position of the center of mass using this measured uh, camera calibration. Um, then the the network will anchor a grid on that 3D position. Uh, and you can take these images, you can project the grid onto the images um, and populate all of the voxels uh, with uh, pixel values. And then we're going to yeah, transfer these pixels into voxels and then use a 3D ConfNet to process these volumes and output a confidence map, which will then be processed to yield the final uh, key point uh, predictions. Um, so supporting all of this, we have a, a GitHub repo, which we'll be drawing from today. Um, and this is just a screen capture of the base of that GitHub repo. And I've, I've highlighted a couple of features of this that, you know, so there's this beginning step, right, where you have to get your, your cameras, you've got to synchronize them, you have to calibrate them, you probably want to compress them. Uh, and so in, in red, I've highlighted here that we have a couple different approaches people have used for camera calibration, one just using a checkerboard and, and an L-frame, another uh, using a laser pointer that you sort of just shine in the arena, and then you can use that to get the calibration for the cameras. Uh, there's also two scripts uh, for camera compression. I'm going to highly recommend this one written by uh, Kyle, Kyle Severson, um, which does uh, onboard GPU compression of videos. And so He's recording from, I think, six uh, high definition cameras uh, with a single uh, computer and compressing all of them in real time on the GPU. Uh, and this is just, you know, makes these recordings uh, far, far, far easier. And so this is an external repo that is linked to in the dance repo. Uh, and then there's another repo that I'm highlighted in green, uh, written by Diego Alderondo, who's a grad student in the old XP lab that uh, is a really fantastic tool for this process of labeling uh, training data. And I'm going to give it some examples of that in a second. And so uh, these sort of steps are all to make this beginning process of, of just setting up the experiment uh, a lot easier. And so if I'll give just some examples of this labeling process. Uh, and so, you know, the nice thing about this uh, label 3D tool uh, is you can visualize simultaneously uh, these six, like all the different cameras you're recording. So this is a rat in a, a, an arena with, with it's sort of on a green screen recorded with six cameras. And so uh, with label 3D, it'll bring up images of all the cameras. And then uh, one of the nice things about it is you can just click on the center of mass here in a couple different views. And then you can just hit a button to triangulate it across the rest of the views. Uh, which will accelerate the labeling process um, because you can use the triangulation from two views and then uh, triangulate it into 3D and then project it into all the different uh, image frames. This becomes very handy uh, when it comes to uh, measuring uh, the animal's uh, full kinematics. And so here we're label, or I guess uh, we're labeling uh, 23 key points on, on this rat. And so first we're gonna zoom in uh, and just visualize the rat uh, and then start to label the key points on the head uh, and spine and limbs. 
And I think where this label 3D approach really comes in handy is you know, the, the limbs are often occluded in multiple views. Um, but you can find the set of views, say these, these bottom two, uh, where here the left forelimb is visible. And you can label the key points in, in just those views where it's uh, visible. And then, as I'll show in a sec, you can triangulate these predictions to all the other views. Uh, and then this is, again, very useful for uh, really augmenting all of the training data you get because you know, you're only labeling a subset of views, and then you're getting the predictions from all of the cameras. And uh, here you can see uh, that we've triangulated these predictions and now have the labeled examples from all the different cameras. So this is the uh, label 3D software. Uh, and I think you know, it's very helpful for working with these 3D tracking approaches. Uh, with that, I'm going to transition to the CoLab, which is at the perfect spot. Um, so the uh, demo uh, will throw a, a memory error as a, as a side note. Um, but so this tutorial uh, goes through a, a few aspects of dance and the behavioral analysis. So it, we start by just setting up dance uh, and installing dependencies, creating, downloading the GitHub repo and um, uh, creating a virtual environment. And following that, we're going to download a set of video data from uh, the dance GitHub repository and then uh, run dance predictions on that. Um, so, you know, we, you know, these first cells were installing Anaconda into the CoLab notebook. We are then uh, cloning the dance GitHub repo. And uh, so that is just put into the CoLab directory. So if you go uh, and, and do this yourself and look, um, if you look in the content folder of your CoLab notebook, then there will be a, a subdirectory for dance. Uh, and in that uh, contains the entire GitHub repo. Uh, with that, uh, following that, uh, the script creates the dance uh, Anaconda environment, uh, which I've just sort of already installed. But you know, it's using uh, FFmpeg to deal with most of the uh, video processing, uh, as well as dependencies um, from uh, PyTorch and CDDNN. Um, and so that is sort of the set of, of dependencies that the dance uses. And, and so once that installed, we have all these directories and we can start to analyze some video cameras. So uh, the GitHub uh, repo contains a number of uh, demos uh, in, in markerless mice. And because of the, the size of the video files, um, they're, they're small, but they're not that small. So uh, we find it's best to not keep them in the GitHub repo, but we have a, a URL um, that contains a link to the, the video files. And so in, in the repo, if you go into demo, markerless mouse one uh, videos, uh, there is a text file uh, that contains a link to the videos, uh, just a, a Dropbox link. And so this first part, the reason that I wanted to start this collab a little earlier is uh, it, it downloads these uh, video files, which takes about uh, you know, five minutes. And once they've downloaded there, you, in this uh, video directory of the markerless mouse one uh, folder. And so this folder is uh, a dance project folder. Um, and so the organization of it is gonna be standardized across um, all of the data sets you analyze using dance, where you have a video folder that contains the videos you've recorded, uh, organized by you know, camera one, camera two, camera three, camera four, et cetera. Uh, there's also folders for the center of mass labeling that has the uh, prediction results as well as uh, training weights uh, for the center of mass detection network. And then uh, similarly, there is a subdirectory for the dance code that contains the uh, prediction results uh, as well as uh, you know, training and, and the network weights. Um, I am not gonna go over uh, training uh, and, and labeling in this demo. Um, 
I did see that uh, Talmo, I think, had covered some of this in his his uh, tutorial, and I think we'll, we'll sort of stand on his shoulders. Um, but the process uh, is, is well described in the GitHub repo, and I've sort of included this excerpt here, um, where you know, once you have this project folder set up and you also have this, uh, I should forgot to mention this io.yaml file. Uh, so this contains sort of a description of where everything is located in this project folder. So it tells uh, the network where say the center of mass directory is and where the dance directories are and so on and so forth. Uh, then using this, uh, the center of mass network is trained uh, by just running com train and then uh, com predict, uh, and then giving a path to the center of math con mass uh, configuration file, uh, which I think we have some examples of here in the config folder. So, you know, this is the actual script that's being run by, say, com predict or com train. Uh, and it just has uh, several of the different hyperparameters uh, that you would use. And you don't, I think, typically need to modify any of them to get it to work. But if you really wanted to train, change, say, the batch size uh, or the learning rate, uh, you could change them in here. I'm just going to close that. Um, so, you know, that's training the com finder. And in this uh, demo file, the com finder has already been trained. Uh, and we have the uh, prediction results uh, as a mat file and a, and a pickle. Um, and the network has also been trained. And so we're just going to download in this next cell uh, the uh, weights um, for the, the training. Um, and so, you know, similarly, uh, if you wanted to run the uh, dance training, uh, you would just use dance train and then you'd give a path to here the dance configuration file. It's in that same configs folder, uh, and you know there's a different uh, set of hyperparameters that I'll that I'll mention in in a bit. Uh, so you know with these uh, network weights, we can then run the prediction, um, and so this typically takes a second to run. So I won't uh, quite quite go through it here. Uh, but you just run dance predict and then you give it a link to this uh, config file. And so this config file, again, there's a number of, of different parameters and it, you don't really need to change any of them to get it to work out of the box, aside from maybe one, which is this volume size parameter, which is just the size of the 3D volume in millimeters anchored on the animal. Uh, and so this can vary if you are using, say, a marmoset and you want it to be more on the order of, say, 500 millimeters uh, versus a mouse uh, where it's going to be on the order of, say, 100 millimeters. Uh, and this can be important because, you know, in contrast to 2D networks, you know, we're only using, say, 64 voxels on a side. And so there is some sort of resolution uh, trade off that you're going to see with the volume size there. Um, the there's a number of other parameters here. Uh, and I just want to mention that if you look at the dance uh, GitHub page, uh, that there is a, a wiki. And the wiki has sort of an in-depth discussion of all of the different required parameters. So say the batch size, or the number of epics, uh, or the volume size that you're using, uh, which, you know, for instance, this should be big enough to fit the entire animal with a little wiggle room to accommodate noise in the center of mass. Uh, as well as other optional parameters, if you were a real power user uh, and wanted to change, uh, say, the GPU ID or the amount of median filtering that goes on, uh, you could change those in the config file as well. Uh, but I think for most users, really, if you're, you know, the, the biggest parameter you need to change is just the size of the 3D volume that goes in. And so, uh, the prediction results, uh, because we started this before, have already been run. So if we look in uh, the dance, this demo folder, then we can see that there is a uh, save data avg <laughs> file that, that has been run. So let me give you an example of what some of these predictions look like. Uh, so this is just the view from one of the cameras, um, which because of the way Colab works, we just have to uh, 
compress the video and have a, a few extra lines of code to visualize it. Uh, so that's going to take just a second to, to load in and run. Are people able to get the code to run, like run a prediction? Uh, yeah, so the I've actually pre-run it. Um, and so we could we could start that in a second. Um, but it, you know the prediction on Colab, so I, I should say the prediction I think can run at about 10 Hertz um, and is very paralyzable. So you know we can record for a few hours each day and just kind of run it run it either offline or in real time. but in Colab it can take a little while to run so I wanted to kind of spare everyone the waiting time for that. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on with this uh, video file, but um, this is, I'll describe in words, is uh, just one of the videos that we record as well as the reprojected points uh, from this prediction file uh, on top of the videos. Um, and it's really taking its time. Oh, I see. Jesse, so there yeah. is a comment in the chat about yeah. Some people having issues with unzipping the videos. Have you encountered this problem? No, I actually haven't seen that. Um, I have to say, I'm not a Colab Power user, so I, my first bet might be a Stack Overflow. <laughs> um, but if other people can locate this, I think one of the challenges with Colab is like, I don't know if I have any sort of privileged, you know, privileges that other people don't have. But if anyone can recapitulate that, I'd be very interested. Um, so, okay, this is just an example of one of here Kyle's videos, being this is a talk at MIT. Uh, and you can see, you know, very high resolution recording of a mouse. And we've just taken several of these videos and run the key point prediction on top of them, which is, of course, uh, taking its uh, sweet time. Oh, I see, because it's waiting for me to give input. So hopefully this will run in a second. Um, but so yeah, this is just an example of what these points reprojected on top of the video look like, um, which is very small. But I think that's that's all we're going to get. Um, but you know, this is just an example of what it outputs, which is the sort of 22 key points uh, here projected right on top of the animal. Um, so that is the sort of dance uh, pipeline and project folder organization. And I should also mention that a lot of these sort of steps as far as calibrating cameras, synchronizing cameras, formatting, like compressing camera data, putting this in a project folder are gonna be common to any sort of deep learning approach to post detection and 3D post detection. Um, and so, you know, even if you opt not to say use dance for your approach, I think a lot of these steps are gonna be common to any approach that you're gonna use. Um, but so once you have these uh, prediction results, we can start to use some of these approaches for analyzing 3D kinematics. And so we can start uh, by just loading in the predicted prediction data, uh, this dance predict results, save data average. Um, and we can start by just plotting them. Uh, and so you can see the dance outputs these, you know, very smooth time traces of the 3D kinematic predictions. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit uh, and pretend that we ran that over a, a full uh, recording of a, a mouse. So not just over say several minutes, but over a, a, an hour long recording session. Uh, and so there's a separate uh, drop uh, zip file here, which hopefully everybody can open uh, that has uh, these larger recordings. Uh, and I should say that we kind of typically switch a little bit between Python and MATLAB, uh, just because uh, a lot of the 3D visualization code in MATLAB is a little easier to use. Um, and so here we're just going to uh, convert this, this data file, which is a .matic file, into a Python readable uh, format. Um, and then, so we have this sort of data structure that has all of these kinematics. And from that, we want to say compute a behavioral embedding of, you know, one of these behavioral maps that I showed you previously. So to do that, the first step is to compute the eigenpostures of the animal. Um, and so, we just take this uh, these key point data set measurements. So and so the 3D marker position over time, 
Uh, although I'll just note that I also did a little bit of sleight of hand and put this in an aligned coordinate frame. So we have the animal fixed, you know, center of mass fixed, aligned in, in some axis, and then look at deviations around that um, aligned animal. And then we can just run PCA on this set of marker positions. And so we can take the here 81 uh, dimensional uh, matrix of aligned key points uh, by here, I guess it's a million different time points. It's like an hour of data at 100 hertz. And then we can extract out just the top 10 eigenpostures of the animal. Uh, and if we just visualize this as a heat map, you can see that there's some you know, transition over time. There's these little green blobs, which probably correspond to when the animal is uh, either rearing or grooming or something, something like that. And so that's one set of features that we can use for computing a behavioral embedding. So we can compute just a pose embedding. But then it often helps to have some uh, kinematics associated with those. And so in addition to just the instantaneous posture, we're also going to use a wavelet transform to look at the local variations of this posture in time, but you know, compress it with, with the time frequency transform. And so here I'm just uh, taking a wavelet transform of these uh, eigenpostures. Uh, and so just using the CWT function uh, of these different uh, score components, so just the eigenpostural scores of the animal. Uh, one small detail is that here I'm using a Mexican hat wavelet just because the Mortlet wavelet wasn't built in, but that's a, a minor detail. Um, I think if you're doing this on your own, you'll probably want to you know, vary a little bit uh, to see uh, what type of, of features make the most sense for your application. Um, but so once again, we can run, uh, if we look at the wavelet transform and we concatenate them over the 10 eigenpostures, uh, we end up with something that is about, I want to say 150 dimensional. Uh, so we have a big 150 by million uh, uh, matrix. That's the, you know, the wavelet components over time. And then we can once again run PCA on those. And so we have the eigenpostures as well as the principal components of the wavelet transform of these eigenpostures. Uh, and so this is going to be another uh, sort of 10 by a million matrix. So now we have a bunch of different features describing the animal's behavior on individual frames. And we can uh, use TSNI or your favorite sort of embedding approach to uh, visualize variations in this pose. And so here I'm just going to subsample and look at, at frames every second. Um, and uh, here I'm going to start by just looking at the an embedding of the animal's pose. And so I'm going to take these eigenpostural scores uh, and running TC on them here with a perplexity of 30 uh, using two components. And uh, it'll just take a second to run. Um, and I should say that, you know, generally for TC, I use a perplexity of, of 30 if there's sort of fewer than 100,000 samples and uh, more if you have uh, larger samples just to get the space looking nice. Um, I guess the other detail typically with TSN is you want to subsample the data appropriately before putting in. Um, so for most applications, you might want to say, pre-run k-means and so on the data set and sort of smartly sample the time points you're putting in. Um, because, uh, you know, with TSNI, the you know, size of a region in space corresponds more to the number of time points you have than to the sort of Euclidean diversity because it um, doesn't preserve kind of global distances. And so you might, your mileage might vary a little bit there. You might want to try a UMAP or something like that. Um, but those are a couple kind of tricks of the trade. All right, so if you look at the uh, embedding, uh, you get out something that looks like a bunch of stuff, um, but you can see that it's uh, highly structured. And so there's a lot of sort of small structure in this space. And um, if we were to visualize the time points around these, which uh, we haven't yet worked into this CoLab notebook, you would see that they would correspond to similar types of behaviors. And so these sort of outerlying regions would probably be some types of, of grooming over here, and maybe you'd have a large rearing cluster over there. And then typically there's a big interior portion that's various types of walking or postural adjustment behaviors. Um, you can do the same thing with the wavelets. Um, and so you can take the TCD embedding and, and run them on the wavelets uh, transform data to get another uh, map of all of the kinematic variation. Uh, and so that's going to run and it'll look a little squishier than the pose. Um, 
And it, you know, finally, it, it, maybe I'll, I'll skip running this uh, in the interest of time, but you know, we can run this and get the embedding of both of these, uh, which will visualize not only changes in pose, but also uh, kinematic variation across these different poses. And so this can be useful for um, uh, yeah, getting, getting sort of a, a longer time scale behavior organized from the data set. Um, so you know, this will run. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just give another visualization of um, what the sort of annotation looks like. And so following the sort of TCNE embedding, the next step in all this would be to just say cluster the TCNE space um, using either k-means on the high dimensional space or a, a watershed transform uh, in the TCNE space. Either, I think they typically produce fairly comparable uh, results uh, and then annotate the different clusters uh, you see. I have a question about the TISNI actually. So um, can you go over the parameters that the TISNI accepts and how can we fine tune those parameters? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so TISNI, there's, there's basic parameters. Um, I would say are the number of components, like the number of dimensions you're embedding into, which typically everyone uses too. Uh, and I should say, you know, a lot of this is based on work by Gordon Berman, who's now at Emory. And, you know, he's done some comparisons between say two and three dimensions and found two and three produce similar, you know, embedding results. The perplexity uh, determines, um, it's like basically how many nearest neighbors uh, it's looking for and engaging distances by. And so, you know, TCNE is very, is a really a local approach where it's, you know, basing similarities to these, you know, 30 or 200 nearest neighbors. Uh, at least that's my sort of intuition. Uh, and then, um, you know, it's not ignoring distance on a much larger scale. Uh, and so you can sort of interpret uh, small scale features, but maybe not larger scale distances. Um, and so that, yeah, again, I use 34 sort of smaller data sets like this, and that's kind of the default. And then I do use more for when you have a very large data set of um, several hundred thousand uh, frames. Uh, other things that can go into TSNE are, and I don't know if they're built into uh, Python, um, but the big ones would be, I mean, you can change aspects of like the number of iterations or how the gradient is managed. Um, but I would say the bigger ones are the initialization. Um, and so Dmitry Kobach has done some interesting work on this where they've, you know, there was this whole, I don't know if it was a Twitter thing, or I mean, this is in sort of single, the single cell community, this like UMAP versus TSNE debate. But basically their contention is that if you initialize TSNE with the principal components of the data, that you get out reproducible results, um, and it's sort of comparable to UMAP in that regard. And so that is something I actually would recommend is, and I haven't done it here, but um, you can initialize TSNE with like PC1 versus PC2. And, and you know, the advantage of that is you'll get sort of very similar TSNEs from time to time. Um, there's an approximation known as the Barnes-Hutt approximation um, that is used in like, for instance, this version of TSNE. Uh, so like the original version of TSNE was super, super slow uh, and couldn't really be extended to say like a 10,000 or 100,000. There's Barnes-Hutt. There's also a Fourier transform one. Um, my, I think the Fourier transform one is maybe not an approximation you necessarily need. I, I don't know that I or Gordon have had great results with that one, um, but I like Barnes Hut. Um, and there's like a, you know, a parameter you can set that interpolates between those uh, two. Um, but I would say the, you know, these are sort of uh, a little weedsy. Like I think the biggest thing, so, you know, if you look at the dynamics TSNE versus the pose TSNE, they look very different, right? And so like the biggest thing that is gonna affect a lot of the results you see is the features that you're putting in. Um, and this, I guess also like the other thing I should mention, the last one is the distance metric that you use. And so here we're using uh, Euclidean distance, but you can also use say the KL divergence uh, between different points as your uh, distance metric or you know, pick, pick your poison, uh, right? Um, but yeah, I would say, I would emphasize feature space um, 
And you know, what we're going to get out now is sort of a blend between those. And you can also kind of, you know, scale how much you want to weight, say, pose versus uh, dynamics. Um, but yeah, that is the basic tour. I, I should say the last, the last sort of thing I've learned along the way with TSNI, um, in addition, I mentioned balancing before where, you know, the size of these different regions in TSNI space is more determined by the amount of data you have rather than necessarily their kinematic diversity. That I think would be a little different with UMAP. Um, but, you know, TSNI isn't going to put everything into one point if they're all sort of very similar. It's going to occupy sort of broader regions. So their balancing is important. And then TSNI, I have not gotten good results with more than, say, a couple hundred, there are like 100,000 frame. Like there's a phenomenon that I think is poorly understood known as like compression of the TSNI space um, that if you put in a couple hundred thousand or more points, then the space starts to look kind of funny. Um, so I've seen this noted in the literature, um, but I do not actually know why. I mean, I'm sure you could think of reasons why it would occur, but I, you know, I, it's not, it's just a weird thing at this point. Uh, but yeah, so the, the joint uh, embedding now looks sort of has this squishy feel, but like a little more structure than just the dynamics. And I'm going to, you can see it has a different orientation than the dynamics one because of the random initialization. And I'm just going to decrease the amount of dynamics information that we put in and try and rerun it. Yeah, there's a question in the chat about feature selection. Um, and so I would say there's a set of like default features that I use, um, which are just the eigenpostures of the animal and their wavelet transform. Um, and as well, and, and sometimes I also will in the, and I think this is, um, there's a repo associated with the capture project um, that uh, has like, more code, I would say, on this that I'll just try and enter into the. Uh, but yeah, so basically, there's a default set of features associated with those, and uh, that I think is going to be useful for most applications. Um, but I think if you want to get creative, you can start um, adding other kinematic features of, say, the animal's center of mass um, or uh, things like that. Let's see, let's see. So this capture demo, I think, has more of the, the features here. Uh, but I would say that, um, you know, aside from like eigenpostures and their wavelet transform, which again is, you know, sort of based on this older work by Gordon Berman starting from, from images, uh, there's a bit of flexibility in what you get out. And it sort of depends on whether you're getting, um, you know, whether it's separating out the things you want to separate out. Um, but I think generally, like we find that for say the mice, we get, you know, if we just use eigenpostures and their wavelet transform, we separate out grooming and rearing uh, and, you know, various subtypes of grooming, you know, body grooming um, and, and walking and so on and so forth. So I think that's good for most applications. But if you're finding that, you know, the space, say, doesn't have enough structure, or there's like uh, different things that, you know, have different center of mass velocity, but otherwise look similar, you might want to supplement this with other sets of features. Yeah, so thanks so much, Jesse. I think this is a really great resource and toolbox for everyone doing animal behavior analysis. So thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for, for your time. So happy to, happy to answer any more questions as well. <laughs>